Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. This is the fifth lecture, What is Sufism? And this will be our last in this series, Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Tonight, the topic is titled, Giving Reality a Voice in the World. So, what we want to talk about tonight is the Sufis as the heirs and the cultivators of the hidden camel load of knowledge. We've talked about that more than once since we began this class. That it is authentically transmitted from the Prophet wasallam, from Abu Huraira and from others that the Blessed Prophet wasallam, transmitted two types of hadith information. And Abu Huraira refers to them as, as camel loads, wiqarayin. One of them is to be exposed to everyone, and the other one is not. The other one is for very few. And in the transmissions of those reports, there are clear indications that to transmit the knowledge of the hidden camel load would be very dangerous and catastrophic. In other words, the common people would not accept it, and perhaps we can also add that the people in power would not accept it. What was in that hidden camel load? Well, quite frankly, the hadith doesn't say explicitly to my knowledge, other than to indicate that it would be, it cannot be exposed publicly without its being misunderstood and without the reactions being very strong against it. Some scholars say that it is detailed knowledge of the fitan, of the kind of things that uh, Hudayfa would ask about, the horrible things that are going to happen, such as the rulership of Yazid, or the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and things like that. And we do know that the companions knew about that. They knew about the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. And then other details. Um, we know when we take all the hadith that pertain to the end of time that they tell us amazingly detailed information about things that are going to happen. Often those hadith are weak. And no doubt they're weak because they come from the hidden camel load, because it's not transmitted the same way. It's given to its people, whom we believe are the people of the Sudur, the people of Dhikr, the Sufis, the great Sufis, the real ones, the keepers of trusts. And that doesn't mean that all those weak hadith are accurately transmitted, because they also can be uh, fabricated. Something's happening over here. Okay. So, and no doubt, I do believe, although my belief is not in any way a proof, I do believe that that hidden camel load is about the end of time also, all the events that will be to the end of time. Because we know the Prophet taught that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Sufis believe also that that hidden camel load gives us ontological truths. Ontological truths means it teaches us truths about the structure of reality, the nature of reality, um, the haqqaiq that underlie a creation and the reality of things as they truly are in themselves and in um, 
the knowledge of God. Okay, so those are haqqaiq. And the other kamalod, which is the kamalod that is so blessed and so beautifully transmitted in Bukhari and Muslim and Nasa'i, Ibn, uh, you know, uh, Abu Dawood, um, and, uh, you know, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and many other books. Those are mu'amalat. That, that's ilm al-mu'amala. It's about how we lived with each other, and how we pray, and how we fast, and how we're good, and how we're bad. So it focuses on mu'amala. Although, as we pointed out, sometimes you get things of mukashifa in them, or things of haqqaiq in them. Even in that, such as the hadith, that my servant does not approach me by such and such and such and such until I love him, and when I love him, I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, uh, and so forth. What does that mean? And how do you explain that? That is, and, and this is also so that we see that there's something else there also. It's not just that outward knowledge that all can easily understand. So we want to talk about that tonight and we can call that giving reality a voice but also we can call it uh, opening the camel load of hidden knowledge for the sake of civilization and for the protection of belief and faith and ethics and um, and other things because this metaphysical knowledge, this ontological knowledge, it is necessary to civilization. It must be there. And this is what we want to talk about tonight and explain why that is true. Um, and so tonight we're going to talk about a number of great Sufis who wrote about these things. And there's blessing in their names, so I'm going to give you some of their names, but not all or even most of their names. But there's blessing in their names. And again, you find with these that they explain the structure of reality. And this is profound, beyond words. And they also tell us about all of the events that are going to happen until the end of time. And all of this is essentially hidden. They hid that knowledge among themselves and they taught it to a select few. And a lot of it remains hidden to this day. And we hear of and know of people that we know personally who have actually seen these books that will tell you about everything that's happening right now even talking about some people, uh, like certain great people today, I'm not going to mention their name uh, here because this is being recorded, um, who are prominent in bringing Islam to life in the West, in America, for example. A number of them, by name. Okay, but those books are hidden. And the person who was allowed to see that, that I know of, was allowed to see it for maybe two weeks in an extremely isolated place and he had to then give it back. He couldn't even copy anything out of it. So they hide this away, they keep it. And the Sufis do have access to knowledge of what's going to happen. They don't all have it and they don't all have it with the same precision. But this is also part of their legacy. And maybe it's correct to say also that if we would honor them and respect their legacy and of course hold them to the standards they set for themselves, there would be great benefit in that. Because they know where the dead ends are and they also know where the openings are. يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْ كُلِّ غَبْرَاءَ مظلمة. They will come out of every disastrous calamity. That's the nature of the awliya. They will find a way out. And so that's what they do here also. Because in having that information, they also tell us, what do we do today? Where is the place to work? What is the thing to do? And we hope that God will guide us to that. To that. 
So after that little preface, uh, let's begin to talk about giving a reality, a voice in the world. And here, uh, there is a very important principle, and this is that nearness to God is nearness to reality. Nearness to God is access to reality. And what is the Sufi path? The authentic Sufi path, as you know, has only one intention. Not to be a wali, not to have karamat, not to be famous, not to be wealthy, not to be powerful, not to even live long or to be healthy, but to come close to God. Bess. To know God and to serve God and to approach Him. You know, we talked last night about sharia and tariqa and haqiqa. You know, the prophetic law in its glory. The tariqa, which originally, as you know, is the methodology by which you get from tariqa to haqiqa and from haqiqa to sharia. And then we talked about how that also becomes an order, a Sufi order, after with great Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani and then uh, these great people that came after him. Okay, so, uh, and then you have the haqiqa, and they would say also that sharia is ibadah. Sharia, how do you know how to worship God? Fiqh, right? How do you make wudu? How do you pray? So, sharia is ibadah. Tariqa is ubudiyah. Tariqa is being a person who turns them over, a servitude to God. I don't really know how to translate it because haqiqa is ubudah. So that's what they will say, that sharia is ibadah, tariqa is ubudiyah, and haqiqa is ubudah. Ubud is even higher than ubudiyah. That's like when you become the embodiment and the epitome of the knowledge and the service and the worship of God. May God make us all that way. There's nothing above Ubuda. That's the highest of all. So when you want to know God and you set out on that path and you draw closer to Him, what happens to you? You become real. You become real. We talked about men of Allah yesterday. And we saw that they are both women and men. And they have to have intellect and the woman has to be perfectly balanced in her femininity and her masculinity, in her male and female principles. And the man has to be, have intellect, and he must also be perfectly balanced in his male principle and female, in his masculinity and his femininity. Otherwise, he's not perfect. Okay, so that's becoming real. And you cannot approach God without becoming real. And as you approach Him, you will become realer and realer and realer. Okay? And of course, as you become real, you have access to reality. And we mean here reality with a capital R. Reality that knows the nature's, nature of things. And here the, the Sufis give us treasures which are difficult, if not impossible, to understand. They're difficult, if not impossible, to understand discursively, meaning with the ordinary intellect and intelligence that we have. You have to have light, and you have to also have, you've got to have fat. But like they tell us amazing things. Let's just take an example. How many levels of reality are there? Some people say, what? Reality is, this is it. What I hear, touch, taste, smell, and see. Nothing more. Okay, well, that's what most people today believe. That's the secular, reductionist, materialistic view of reality. And most Muslims would easily admit, as the Sufis believe, that there are at least three levels to reality. Mulk, which they understand to be this world apprehended by the senses, Malakut, which is the angelic spiritual world from which this comes, which is superior to it, and Jabarut, 
the realm of lights before creation itself, on the verge, on the brink of creation. Okay, so those are three levels. And again, haqqa'iq, let's just mention this and may God forgive us if it's inappropriate. But this microphone here pertains to mulk, right? I can touch it, I can hear it, I can see it, and so forth. Okay? And in Malakut there is a reality of this microphone. And in Jabarut there is a reality of that microphone. Here is the reality of the microphone as mulk. Where will I find the reality of the microphone as Malakut? In the seventh heaven? Way up there? No, right here. And where will I find the reality of the microphone as Jabarut? Right here. Okay, that's baffling, isn't it? I find it intoxicating, but it's very baffling. But it means that, that you know, it's all about your heart. And the journey to Allah is in your heart. It's not a journey of a million miles or of a hundred light years. And it's not like a journey to the outer realms of the galaxy. It's, it's a journey that takes place here by the unveiling of the heart. And then you see these things as they are, right there in front of you. Right there in front of you. So this is what they do. They begin to give us, these are ontological truths. And again, do the common people need them? Yes and no. They do not need them for their own instruction because most of them would not understand them. In fact, they would be so confused. That confusion might lead to the destruction of their psyches or of their iman. It would be a fitna. But they do need it. It's got to be embodied in the structure of their society and the design of their society. In things like science, in things like architecture, in things like art, and if you take your great architecture that you have here, Sultan Hassan, and we can you know, talk about so many other things, that's all metaphysical. It's all golden section. It's all understanding uh, the nature of, of pairs and the nature of triads. And, all the, and that's all haqqa'iq. God created in pairs. Why? What does that mean? That's metaphysical truth. And then after the pairs, there were triads. One of the first triads is Mulk, Malakut, and Jabarut. Another triad is color. Right? Black and white, pairs. But colors are triad, right? Yellow, blue, red. All colors come from yellow, blue, and red. So it's a triad. These are profound truths. And again, the common person working at his shop, plowing his fields, catching fish in the sea, he and she doesn't need that. But the civilization does. And the science does. And especially today. Because today we live in the era of pseudo-metaphysics, of false philosophy reductionist philosophy and you could set that right you could help you could find the solution to quantum physics and its conundrums its its problems you could even tell us about the reality of the galaxies and of the stars they can't because they have no metaphysics that's the problem with quantum physics it gets down so far to nuclear particles and subatomic nuclear particles that cause and effect don't work anymore. And things are happening there that baffle the scientists to this moment. But that problem is metaphysical. And with metaphysics, you can make the physics right. And then it's not a problem anymore. And then you'll have real physics. 
Okay? So this knowledge is important. And it is fard kifaya. And in some civilizations you don't need it. For example, in the early days of Islamic civilization, we're busy with other things. We're consolidating the ummah. We're establishing the rule. We're governing. And we're protecting our borders. And Islam is spreading. And there was no need for this, although it comes in very early. And the Sahaba were attuned to these things. But then later on, especially when the challenge of philosophy comes, and uh, other challenges like that, contact with other religions and other spiritualities, then you've got to have this. And then how many levels of reality are there, by the way? Just three? And, you know, the Sufis will say at least 40, four, zero. You know, and again, that is not fard al ayn and that's not something to talk about on the mimbar in the khutbah, and it's not something to teach in elementary classes on Islam. But it is profound, and I believe that it is true. Absolutely, and it explains so many things, and many of those things today must be explained for the sake of science, for the sake of psychology, for the sake of anthropology, for the sake of sociology, uh, for, for many other things as well, for the sake of the environment. Because our metaphysics and our sharia are there to support the environment and protect the environment. And if you have a false metaphysics, which is unfortunately the case today, and that world is dead and it has no value except as we use it, then you will destroy the environment. The destruction of the environment today is necessarily a reflection of the destruction of metaphysics, the destruction of ontology. So, the path that takes you to God is a path that makes you real. And therefore, since you've become real, you have access to reality. As it is, the levels of existence the amazing nature of that, and so many other things. The nearer that we come to God, the more perfect we become. And the more perfect we become, meaning you get balanced. You know, you are a true woman. You are a true man. The male principle is where it's supposed to be, and the female principle is where it's supposed to be, and both perfectly balanced. You know, then you truly can be God's steward on earth. You can be God's visitant on earth. The more near to God we become, the more beneficial we become, the better we become morally and ethically and physically. Again, we can go back to a Derdir's amazing definition of Sufism as Ilmun Yu'rafu bihi salamatu as sadri wal hawas a science by which we know the soundness of the heart and all the senses, including the internal senses, like imagination. So what's that all about? Reality. Reality and accessing reality. So you can smell it, you can taste it, you can touch it, you can see it, you can hear it, you can imagine it, you can grasp it. And these things are really important, brothers and sisters, especially today. In this age, which is a great age, amazing technology but which is plagued by the curse of Cartesian dualism Cartesian dualism which means that I can never know the world I can never access the world and in our worldview again the one that's taken from the hidden camel load you are the little world and that is the big world you are the little man and that's the big man what we call the microcosm and the macrocosm, meaning you are the blueprint of reality. Reality is the blueprint of you. And that means, among other things, you can know the red apple. In modern physics, modern physics doesn't believe in red apples. It's not allowed to. It can't. Because it doesn't know what's actually out there. That's Cartesian dualism. It knows that 
in all probability, there is a molecular structure out there. And I perceive it as a red apple. Does it exist as a red apple? I, I don't know. Does it exist even in three dimensions? I don't know. Because there's a complete rupture between subject and object. Okay? And for us, no. I have a kinship relationship with the red apple. I have a kinship relationship with the flower on the tree. I have a kinship relationship with you. And that means you can know me, I can know you, I can know that flower, I can know the apple, I can know all of these things. And here we come to this amazing paradox that when you read in traditional books, you encounter, and that baffled me for decades. You know, when they asked the question, is the name the same as the thing named? Halil ismu hu al musamma. I mean, I think the first time I read that, I was trying to be polite, but it's like, why in the world are we asking this question? I mean, if I say fire, are you going to burn up? Obviously, the name is not the thing name. No, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Not when you understand the ontology of you in a kinship relationship with everything out there. Then name actually can become thing name. The name can be the king, the, the key to the thing named. Now, th these are profound things, profound truths, brothers and sisters, and may we respect them. I don't understand them. I love them. But I don't understand them, but at least honor them. Honor. This is sacred knowledge. This is sacred knowledge, and this comes out of the camel load that the Prophet gave to Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, and to Imam Ali, and to Abu Bakr, and to Umar and to others of the Sahaba. Okay, that's what this is. The highest human beings are those who are the most real. The realer that you become, the higher you become. The realer you become, the higher you become. The lowest human beings are those who are the least real. Okay, the highest human beings are the most authentic. And the lowest are the least authentic. And <coughs> brothers and sisters, we live in a time of people who are not authentic. They are not real. And we live in a virtual world which is reducing them <coughs> to shadows of humanity. It's creating bonsai human beings. And that's very dangerous. That's dangerous for civilization. That's danger for, dangerous for the future. We have got to create authentic human beings. And inshallah, you begin by making yourself authentic. And you are authentic. But go higher and higher and higher. Not for the sake of authenticity. Not for the sake of highness. Not for the sake of power. But in order to be close to God. To know God and to be real. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And as we become real and we approach God and may he give us all the ability to do that, the strength to do that, you have to be strong for that. But as we approach that reality, you know, then um, we are faced with the oceans of haqiqa, the oceans of these ontological truths that are amazing, absolutely amazing. And now we come to ultimately know reality in a way that is worthy of God, in a way that is attached to or connected to God's knowledge of the world that he created. Do we have God's knowledge? Absolutely not. Do we approach that? Only metaphorically. But your knowledge becomes sound, and then you can do amazing things. It transforms you absolutely. So defining reality, this is also one of the great gifts to civilization that was given by the great masters. And these great masters, many of whom we're going to talk about, they were commanded to write this. That's why they did it. For some of them, they say, it was dictated to me even. 
And again, I believe that, and I honor that, and I hope that the listener does as well. But Sufism, and again, when we use that word, we're talking about the real thing. The school of Ihsan. We're not talking about, you know, the false Sufis. The ones who have the name but don't have the reality. But Sufism aims at the definition of reality itself. And the very heart of you. The very heart of man and woman. The heart of the human being. Who are you? What are you? What is your reality? How are you structured? Thus, Sufism is by nature oriented in such a way as to engage actively and discursively, that means intellectually, rationally, any ideology, any philosophy, any metaphysics, any psychology, any science, anything that human beings do, technology, architecture, whatever it might be. And the beauty of Islamic civilization, and tell me any civilization that is more beautiful. There are many beautiful civilizations. Beauty is the splendor of truth. To the extent that people have truth, they will have beauty. And most human beings have access to a part of truth, a significant part of truth, in various degrees. And especially if they go back in their past, then they have more and more access. So beauty is the splendor of truth. Again, this is why these people, these great Sufis, they are the ones who brought us beauty in art, in rugs, in architecture, in everything we did. And in Islamic civilization, everything was beautiful. Everything. And one of the things that illustrates that is that if you went to the village where the peasants live, making their houses of mud, their mud houses were beautiful. And everything they worked with was beautiful. And if you were to go to the desert, to say to the Tawariq, these desert, you know, Bedouins who cover their faces with veils in the Sahara Desert, you know, their encampments are so beautiful, you would not believe. And if you took a rug, if you bought a rug from the Tawariq, Maybe you could sell it in Paris or in London for a fortune. Why? Because they have beauty. And that's the way we were. Everything we did was beautiful. Today, it's as if everything we do is ugly or bordering on the ugly. And sometimes, I mean, these cities like Cairo, this was one of the wonders of the world. Damascus was one of the wonders of the world. Not to mention Granada. Not to mention Lahore. Not to mention many other cities. They were beautiful. Shiraz, Tus, Meshad. They were beautiful beyond words. And the, the city structure, the city planning, everything was beautiful beyond words. That comes from Islamic law. Islamic law tells us about city planning. But it also comes from these beautiful people who then give you the adornments and who breathe into the architecture its beauty. Um, one of the things that I'd like to bring to your attention is the pomegranate mosque. Wouldn't you like to go visit? It's in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. And it was built actually in, I think, the 19th century. And it was built by a Sufi. And he didn't know anything about architecture. And he didn't know anything about building, but he built it. And he did such a beautiful job of it that the merchants of Colombo said, build the whole thing. And uh, so he built it. And they said, uh, they, and he said, all I want from you is just the materials. Don't pay me. So they, they wouldn't, he wouldn't let them pay him. And it's a beautiful mosque based on the pomegranate. And it's a cultural achievement, in my opinion, of the greatest worth. These are the people who, again, what did the Prophet say? <laughs> Their hearts 
are the radiant lamps of guidance. May we get this back. So much of the trouble of the Muslim world today, the darkness, the ugliness, the fracturing, the rupturing, the crushing, the breaking, is because we turned our backs on this legacy. Not all of us, by any means, but many of us did. And then look at countries like our beloved sister country, Syria. That country preserved this legacy more faithfully than most countries and it also now has been pulverized to the ground and probably to remove the nidham of the awliya that was in that land because they held on to it with a sincerity and an integrity that few Arabs can boast of and in fact few Muslim countries can boast of it's all being destroyed isn't it and often we are the authors of destruction. God forgive us and God bless us. Thus Sufism is that tool that can address everything. And what we will see in the history of these Sufis who use the hidden camel load is that they will actually review the whole intellectual history of Islam. And they will say, this was right, and this was, could have been better. And this was wrong, but it wasn't completely wrong. They're very objective. They're very merciful. They're extremely insightful. Um, and today, this legacy, to me, is priceless, priceless, priceless. That doesn't mean that we're going to teach it to everyone, because, again, not everybody can understand it but it's got to be honored. And the main way that you express these metaphysical truths is not in discursive thought, but it's in art, in poetry, and in other forms of art, especially what I regard to be the highest form of art, architecture. Architecture. And that's why our beautiful, it's like the architecture is so beautiful, but like you go into a mosque like Sinan's mosque in Adirne, I think it's called the Selimiya. It's got the red colors in it. I mean, they almost had to drag me out. It's like, this is all the universe. This is every, this is the whole story. You know, in tile and in color and in windows and in perfect dimensions, golden sections and everything else. And we could say that about so many other mosques as well. So today Sufism offers us a rich and sound legacy that enables us to give sanity back to the world and proper orientation in everything that we do, in science, in psychology, in architecture, in city planning, and maybe we should say especially in being stewards of creation and taking care of the environment. So the Sufis, as it were, had an answer to everything. This is what you get out of that Kamalot, that you've got an answer to everything. Because they have there the keys to explain reality as such in principle and in detail, and they do it. They do it. In explaining reality as such, the great Sufi masters, God be pleased with them, and enable us to honor them, and enable us again to mention their names. We said Sufism itself, if you mention it in many public gatherings in the Muslim world today, you know, you'll be lucky to get out alive. You know, it will trigger the most hostile response imaginable. And even some of the people were going to mention their names you wouldn't dare mention their names in many circles. It would trigger the same kind of response. There are countries where you can't mention their names in school or anywhere else. You'll lose your job. You'll be out of the country. Okay, this is not right. You know, you don't understand them, but at least try to honor them. And honor the people who do understand them. And if you want to understand them, go to the people who do and be just and be fair. But Sufism gave us answers for everything. This is that metaphysical, ontological reality of the second camel bag. 
And therefore, they gave us a credible deen. That's very important. Because the deen cannot just be externalities. It cannot just be technicalities of how you make wudu and how you stand in prayer and what you do in the pilgrimage. And even in our theological discourse. Our theological discourse is adequate, but it's just the beginning. If you study Imam al-Ash'ari, and I love Imam al-Ash'ari, but he believed there was an aqidah and an aqidah. There is the basic aqidah that you teach to the people, and then there is a higher aqidah. This is clear. And Maturidi is like that as well. You know, but they are teaching the truth to the common people. So they give you something adequate, and they only focus on things that are qat'i, that are definitive. So they don't give you the whole picture either, and they're not supposed to. They can't do that. So if you try to find the answer to good and evil in our theology, al-Maturidi is quite good, because he lived in Central Asia, where you had Magians, and they believed that evil and good were eternal principles. They were like gods. So al-Maturidi has to deal with that issue more than Imam al-Ash'ari. But you go to the Sufis and, whoa, they give you the whole story. Evil is privation. Evil is related to nothingness. Evil is psychotic. Now we're talking about something that is profound beyond words. And that's not what we would teach in theology. And basically, in theology, why is there heaven? Why is there hell? Our theologians will essentially want to affirm that heaven and hell pertain to the realm of the possible, which they do. And therefore, if God has willed them, they shall be. Case closed. And it's true, that's really all I need. I have to know that there's nothing irrational about believing in heaven and hell, or believing that Moses's staff becomes a serpent because it did it became a serpent that's not a metaphor it belongs to the realm of possibility so all these possibilities are possible for it and you have to know the nature of possibility okay but then there are also other levels that we can talk about these things so they, they can take you to those levels and sometimes like today that's necessary you've got to explain to people why evil happens and what it is. So the Sufis, therefore, provide a sound way forward. They will come out of every catastrophic dilemma and they'll provide you a way forward. And they gave us the foundation upon which to build civilization, I would prefer to say civilizations with the plural, because I don't believe in Islamic civilization. Islamic civilizations, in the plural. Everywhere we went, our m magic touch created a new civilization. In Nusantara, in Java, in China. And in China you have North Chinese, North Eastern, you have Northwestern, you have Southern. They're not the same. They're very similar, but they're different. And Andalusian, you know, and Sicilian, and uh, so forth. You know, so they were the great creators of civilization. Um, one of the things that we're taught is that mistakes at the point of first principles are catastrophes further down the line. That's a big sentence, isn't it? But it means that when you talk about truth, when you do science, when you do psychology, you've got to begin right. If you don't get the beginning right, you're going to have a disaster sometime down the line. This, brothers and sisters, is the story of modern science. And when we talk about modern science, we have to distinguish carefully between the technology it creates, which is applicable, that's where they're on the strongest footing. And between the ontologies they imagine, where they are on extremely weak grounding. Okay? And the whole issue here, you've got to begin in the right place. 
You've got to have the right definition of reality. Then you will be able to work it all out as you go down the path. Getting things right at the point of first principles and the beginnings, you know, uh, this is essential for all human knowledge. And again, these are the people that understood that and applied that with extreme uh, accuracy and great gifts. Having an answer to everything. Um, metaphysics, especially that of our masters, some of whom we're going to mention. Um, that is a religious and societal necessity. It is fard kifaya. Not fard ayn, no. But it's fard kifaya. Why is that the case? Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, why is anything what it is? Why is evil evil? Why is good good? When religion provides an answer to those things, then religion is strong. And again, at certain levels, it won't even ask those questions. But at other levels, it's got to ask them, and it's got to answer them. It cannot just be shut up and believe, because that's not going to work. That does not work. When religion is unable to answer any question, that is risen, that is brought up, then doubt, deviation, and defection come in. And this is the reality we live in today. This is why we can't keep our youth. This is why you can't, because you can't answer a single problem. They have so many questions. They want to know about chakras and things like that. And you say, that's haram. No, no, you, you're going to have to know what that's about. And you're going to have to know whether that's true or whether that's false. You can't just say, shut up and believe, because most of them won't do that, especially in the context of social and political disaster and confusion. They are having a hard time holding on to the religion as it is. And then you've got an answer to nothing, so maybe I can just check out of this and check into something else. Um, it's natural for people to ask elemental questions. Okay, this is something in children and in adults. Some people have the gift for that. Very basic questions, like who created God? Okay, my daughter asked me that when she was a tiny little girl. Okay, so again, we know that that question, if it comes to me or you, it's from Satan, and you can close the door. But we do have theological answers to that. And we have metaphysical answers to that, too. And at some point, you know, of course, God is not created. He's a necessary being. But, you know, there have got to be answers that are beyond that. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in telling us that that's from Satan, he's not saying that it is forbidden to have any answer in the intellect or in theology or in metaphysics that pertains to that. Um, so these answers have to be given, and they have to be found. So, true knowledge moves the soul, and true knowledge transforms the soul, especially this kind of knowledge. You won't be the same. This makes you believe with a power that is incredible. And the amazing thing also about this legacy is that it enables you to believe in the literal truth of the revelation, which we should anyway. But don't think that they're going to say this is all metaphorical. No, no. They're going to say this is real. And then they will explain to you why it is. Okay, so true knowledge moves the soul and, trans and transforms it. True knowledge is not information. Information does not transform the soul. Information does not guide or misguide in itself. Without the true knowledge of metaphysics, civilization will die. This is in fact what happened to the Christian West, because it undercut 
its metaphysics. And it did that over the last 500 years. It completely scuttled its metaphysics. And its metaphysics before that was fairly sophisticated. Of course, they took a lot from us. They took from El Ghazali, they took from Averroes, they took from Ibn Sina, and they took from others. But all of that was scuttled. And then a pseudo-metaphysics was created in its place. Um, civilization dies without metaphysics, and so does the believer. Especially in a complex society like this. Specialization in metaphysics, or if you want to say, learning the teachings of these great Sufi masters, is not for everyone. Okay, not at all. It's for actually very few. Because it is like higher mathematics. And higher mathematics is not for everyone. Um, but its cultivation is a societal obligation. Where is it expressed? This knowledge to repeat poetry, art, stories, architecture, design, music, city planning, and so forth. That's where you express it. These people, either they get it or they almost get it, but their hearts are able to dance with the music, and they're able to create something beautiful. Um, you take, for example, the metaphysical tradition we talk about. I'm going to also talk about some poets. So, again, among the poets that really knew this stuff, um, there are Arabs, but you have Rumi, and you have Hafiz, and you have others as well. I know of a man who knows Persian, and um, he was in Pakistan. And uh, he went to visit a special sacred place, a special blessed place. And it was outside the city, and he stayed there way too late. And when he came out, there's nobody there. It's dark, and um, he was, I don't know what Pakistani city he was outside of, but he thought like, oh my God, like I've stayed in this place so long, this mosque, and I can't walk home. And then this cart driver came out of the dark, you know, with these two-wheeled carts that you have in Pakistan. And so he told the man in Persian, because he didn't know Urdu, but he did know Persian, and he said, could you take me to such and such a hotel? And the man can't speak Persian, although he knows Persian. But he said in Urdu, yes, I'll take you there. So he sat up on the seat with the driver. He said the driver's clothes were so inexpensive that you could have bought them in the market for, in those days, one dollar. He's very poor. And then this driver, he begins to recite from Rumi, and from Hafiz, the great Persian poets, to this man. And he said, and this man loved metaphysics, by the way, and he studied metaphysics, and he studied these people we're going to talk about. He said, I learned more metaphysics in that cart drive of like 40 minutes or 45 minutes than I learned in 30 years of studying the books. Why? Because art and poetry is one of the highest arts of all, that can give it to you in a way that you can digest. It can make sense of it to you in a way that rational discourse cannot do. So the metaphysical truths then, they become poetic truths. They become artistic truths. They become what we put in our carpets, what we put in our mosques, and the beautiful designs. And this also prepares the people who are even the most uneducated and even the coarsest of people. It prepares them to receive that truth. And at least to live with it harmoniously and to honor it and to respect it. So specialization 
is not for everyone. In fact, it's in, in this, discursively, is for very few. And again, even for the artists and the poets. Not all of them can grasp this either, but many of them can, because they have amazing hearts. Okay, so, this is important. And may it be true, and may God help us. So this knowledge is for kifaya, for civilization. When the deep questions that only metaphysics can answer, like, why is there evil if God is good? Sufis can deal with that. Why is there evil if God is good? Arise in the soul of almost every believer. That is elemental knowledge. That's an elemental question. He or she must find an adequate response. Okay? He or she must be able to calm their heart, to soothe their heart in that regard. If she or he is met with a reprimand, like you're a bad believer, you're a weak believer, how could you ask this question? Or with silence, or ignorance, or an ignorant answer. And this is unfortunately what happens to most of our young people today. I know uh, my Qur'an Sheikh, Sheikh Ayman Suwaid, Allah bless him and protect him, and his father-in-law was Sheikh Abdul Aziz Uyun Asud, who I met. He's one of the greatest Qur'an reciters ever, one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever met on earth. But Sheikh Ayman told me that in Syria, Syria is a very sophisticated culture, so is Egypt, so are other countries as well. But he said this young man went to a sheikh who was a actually decent sheikh and asked him questions about evolution and the sheikh slapped him in the face and uh, told him really harsh things. Okay, so, like, why don't you just say, I don't know? La adri nisful ilm. I don't know is half of knowledge. And... Um, you know, so what happens when we have no answers, especially today, when Islam is so misrepresented, unbelievably misrepresented, and the world media picks that up, so that every day, it seems, there's another atrocity in the name of Islam. Okay, and you and I know that's not Islam at all. That is the biggest travesty ever and these people are not doing good you know they're not doing good they're doing evil they're doing the work of Satan they're doing the work of the Antichrist okay but this is what we see in the news this is what we see on the newsreel and this of course affects Westerners so that Westerners come to fear Islam to be terrified by Islam and it affects the liberals who were on our side more than the conservatives. So we don't have a friend. We don't have a friend. We're in trouble. Honestly, we are in trouble. And then does it affect just the Jew or the Christian or the atheist or the secular? No. It affects the Muslim too. Because the Muslim is like, what kind of a religion is this? And like these people are quoting Hadith. They're, quote, they're quoting Quran. Okay? You have got to respond. You have got to show where the error is, isn't it? And you've got to make that clear. And when we cannot do that, we cannot answer the questions, then usually one of two things happens. The first one is we check out. We check out. Like, I'm really not a Muslim anymore. And we may not say that because we don't want to hurt our father or mother's feelings. Um, but we just become a secularist, an atheist, an agnostic. And we go look at other traditions, new world traditions, because at least they're nice. At least, you know, they give you some good exercises. At least they do answer some questions. This is a problem, isn't it? We, our best young men and women are checking out. 
And if you cannot hold on to your best minds, you don't have a civilization and you don't have a future. You've got to be able to answer these questions. So that's what happens maybe in most cases. They check out. And maybe they don't actually check out, but their faith is wounded deeply. And they worship Islam, they worship the worship of Islam in an anemic way, in an almost lifeless way. They're just barely holding on, and they don't have any strong desire to do so. And in fact, they're deeply sad, and maybe even deeply depressed. That's one thing that happens. And the other thing that happens is that people become what I'm going to call an externalist. Meaning that um, I'm just going to believe in this religion, in its outward form. It is the truth. I don't have an answer to anything, but I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to cut off all of that stuff out there. Okay, so that's another thing that happens. That leads to fanaticism. That leads to radicalism. That leads to violence. So, let's talk about this externalist phenomenon. Um, the externalist is the one who stopped asking the questions. Okay, because they could not be answered. All the externalists are like that. And therefore, they're very shallow people, actually. And their fanaticism reflects the shallowness of their understanding. But they are people, essentially, who stopped asking the questions because no one could answer those questions. And also because if they were to answer those questions, not having an answer to them, then they'll fall into the same doubt, the same confusion, that led their brothers just to check out and their sisters and to become something else. Um, externalism is very dangerous and externalism breeds anger. It breeds, it breeds hatred. You know, man jahi la shay'an ada. Whoever is ignorant of a thing becomes its enemy. And so I'm ignorant of the whole world. I'm ignorant of all the science. I'm ignorant of all the ideologies. I'm ignorant of everything that's out there. So it's quite natural that I become the enemy of all that too. Um, it is based on deprival, externalism, and ignorance, and being blocked from access to what is needed and it produces fanaticism and potential violence. And ironically, in our civilization, God save it and bring it to life, these are the people who are the biggest enemies of the masters we're going to talk about tonight. And those masters are the ones who could give them life. Those masters are the ones who could, you know, give them beauty. Uh, this is an incredible place. This is a beautiful garden. Um, mashallah, how many times have we met here? How many years have we met here? God protect it and bless it. Um, this garden reflects what? Water, doesn't it? The garden is watered. Water is love. Water is love. If we were to come out in this garden every day with a blowtorch, it wouldn't look like this, would it? Or if we were to fail to water it, it would soon die and become ugly. The human heart is like that too. Your heart has to be watered. And it has to be watered with love. And with understanding. And with truth. And the two things that make the heart sick are shahawat, are passions that are out of control, anger and appetite. You know, that's a normal, a constant common human conflict. But the other thing is shubuhat. Shubuhat. Fallacies. Propositions that parade as truth, which are not true. Propositions that parade as true, truth that are not true. They make my heart sick. 
Okay, and this is a big problem we have today. Our hearts are filled with shubuhat. <clears throat> so you've got to have masters who can work with your heart and water your heart and give it love and get those shubuhat out and put truth in its place. And this is what makes Islam so beautiful. <laughs> this is what makes Islam so beautiful. We are people who have jihad. And the Sufis are the biggest mujahids there ever were. You know anyone better than Salah al-Din Ayyubi? You know, this is the murid of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, trained by Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, even as he worked on the, you know, training as a boy, even when he played polo, because Muslims played polo. We're, that's our game. You know, so that we can be the best horsemen in the world and horsewomen. Okay? So he even trained Salah al in his polo. Okay, so, but, and we have the ahkam of jihad. And we are people who defend ourselves. And we stand up for the truth. That we are not violent people. In fact, in history, we are the least violent of all religions. Unfortunately, Christianity is the most violent. And the second most violent in history is Buddhism. That's strange, isn't it? It is a historical fact. Okay, well, we are not violent people, although we have laws of war and of engagement and disengagement. But the reason why we're not a threat to anyone is because we have beauty, we have understanding, we have wisdom. We're not enemies of the world. But when we become externalists, we don't understand anything, everything is a threat, and basically we become enemies of the world. Um, there must be ihsan, and this is one of the greatest fruits of ihsan of all. Um, okay, <clears throat> so the secularist, the agnostic, the atheist, they are also another type of externalist. And in many civilizations, in my, my countries like my own, the secularist liberal, ironically, is one of the most intolerant of all people. They know that you're going to be like them tomorrow. Would you just hurry it up a little bit? Uh, I'll still tolerate you, but like, when are you going to take off your scarf and be real? Okay, that's a liberal proposition. But the secularist, the atheist, the agnostic in our age, they're also another type of externalist. Now here I'm not talking about the Muslims who checked out. Because the Muslims who checked out, they're actually looking for something else. They're not content to be externalist. If they were, they probably would have stayed in the religion. But the normal result of secular education, given its pseudo-metaphysics, is to produce a reductionist <coughs> mentality. Reductionism is the thread that goes through almost all modern thought. Reductionism. You reduce the thing to just a portion of what it is. Okay? So, for example, in physics, Descartes begins by saying that reality is just one thing, one level of reality, and it is race extensa, things extended in space, which are things and objects, and it is race cognitans, the perceiving cognitive mind, which is the subject. Okay? This is where modern physics begin. it's, begins. it's a disaster. That's what lays the foundation for what we talked about earlier, Cartesian dualism. It's a prison. It's a prison. Okay? Now, that was a mistake at the beginning, right? But it's reductionist, because reality cannot be reduced to that. Things are more than extensions in space. And your basic theology will tell you that. See, so that's not an adequate definition. Psychology. You know, you're going to study the psyche? That's great. The ego? The soul? And nothing else? I mean, if you want to study the psyche, that's great. But you've also got to study about the intellect. You have to study about the heart. You have to study about the spirit. And, I'm sorry to say this, but 
are there, is there anybody out there like angels or like spirits or like demons or devils? Because they're out there too. And you're going to study psychology and not talk about possession? And of course that would be unthinkable in secular psychology. But then what kind of psychology are you doing? You know, uh, one of our dear brothers who works in emergency medicine in Chicago, and uh, he works in hospitals, you know, for people who are among the poorest and the most deprived. And uh, he sees horrible things there. God bless him, because he takes care of the people. But a little boy was brought to him, a black boy. And the boy is probably 10 years old, and he can't make eye contact. And his mother says that he's been hypnotized. That's what she thought. She says somebody hypnotized him. Well, probably he was sexually abused. That's probably what happened. You know? But our brother looked at him and he said, My God, he's possessed. That's what he said. And one of the nurses said, Doctor, do you want me to go get a crucifix? Would you like me to go get a crucifix? I mean, like, possessed? Are you serious? No, he was possessed. But sexual abuse is how that happened. So there is possession, but the opening comes through sexual abuse. See? And so to a psychologist and, I think, a neurologist, they come in. They don't have any time. He's just a little black boy. He can't pay anything. And just like this um, psychotic, you know. I don't know if he's schizophrenic or whatever. And then they give him these medicines. Okay, so he's ruined for the rest of his life, probably, right? He's now been diagnosed as psychotic. I mean, um, now this kind of mistake shouldn't be made even by modern psychologists. They should have the training to recognize sexual abuse. You know, but nevertheless, reductionism. This is the name, unfortunately, of the game in our modern scientists. So we produce a reductionist mentality a secular externalist who is also intolerant of other ideas. You think you can go to an American university and debate about evolution, taking the negative side, that evolution is absurd, that we believe in creative evolution, yes, by God. I don't deny that there were dinosaurs. You know, but God did it. It can't be by chance. You think we could go and have a nice, calm, honest talk about that? at the University of Chicago, or Harvard, or Yale, or anywhere else? No, no. And if you are a professor, you're going to lose your job. So what kind of toleration is that? What kind of academic freedom is that? So this produces an intolerant, generally complacent lack of intellectuality, combined with often mental arrogance. This produces the phenomenon of an unenlightened soul, incapable of admitting, even to itself, that any mode of knowledge could possibly be beyond its scope. Externalized people are conscious of only a small part of their souls, not to mention the world. Externalized people are conscious only of a small part of their souls, their psyche, uh, not to mention the world. And again, I want to remind you of our brother in Jakarta, uh, who is a master of Aikido. And, you know, Aikido is one of the great martial arts, <clears throat> and Aikido can beat everything out there, everything. But one of the secrets of Aikido is that you don't hate your enemy, and that you don't want to destroy your enemy. So in Aikido, they talk about the sword of death and the sword of life. In Aikido, you will always use the sword of life. The sword of life, we will put at your throat. And I've seen this. I've seen demonstrations of this that are unbelievable, of this master. I mean, I've seen him attacked by five swordsmen, and he gets every one of them. Okay, but then, do you want me to put it in your throat or not? That's why it's the sword of life. And they'll say, no, no, I surrender. Okay, but you can only do this with profound spirituality. And that means you've got to know more about your soul than the part you didn't know. And he has re 
rehabilitated in Jakarta. Radical Muslims, some of them were in ISIS, and if they're not in ISIS, they're ready to go. And if they're not doing that, they still have that ideology. And uh, he's able to get them to come and train with him. A lot of them will leave him. None of them trust him in the beginning. But he has been able to rehabilitate many of them. Because he said they're basically gang members. So you can't lecture to them about Islam. And for them, jihad is taking an AK-47 or a bomb or something like that and attacking and killing innocent people. Okay, that's what it is. And if you don't agree, then you're the enemy. There's no discussion here. That's the way gang members think. So he saw that. I can't talk to them about Islam, but I can teach them martial arts. And when he does this, when he teaches them this spirituality that enables them to do the impossible move, and I've seen it myself. I've even had him do that to me. You know, he said many of them start to cry like babies because it opens them up to a depth that was blocked off their spirit and then they begin to become beautiful okay so these th these are all very very important things inshallah and um, I know that I shouldn't look at my watch and I did and I figured that I'm really behind tonight and um, anyway uh, we should get on so um, Sufism then is of course the quest to know God Ihsan and to draw close to him and that is to become real and to become real is to become truly human and to have access to reality so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that because uh, out of this comes one of the greatest crowns of Islamic civilization and that is transcendent humanism Transcendent humanism. Um, we are the greatest humanists who ever lived. And um, by the way, I have to say this, humanism in the West, which is not transcendent humanism, it's animal humanism. But humanism in the West, which is probably their biggest value of all, it is deeply affected by us we were humanists. It's impossible to believe that today, isn't it? But we were. And uh, the book that I think I've mentioned it every year I've come here that I'd like you to have and to read on this is by you know, the great uh, Christian, Arab Christian Orientalist, George Maqdisi. And he was really a great man. He's one of those great Arab Christians that really was our friend. And George Maqdisi uh, writes the book, The Rise of Humanism. That, brothers and sisters, is an academic book of the highest quality. And he shows how Western humanism <coughs> comes into the Western world, not just through Muslims, but very much through the mediation of Muslims, especially the Udaba and the chancellery scribes and the, the literary figures. That's an amazing book. People like um, Ibn Qutayba, for example. Abdullah Ibn Qutayba. And he proves that. And he's got thorough evidence on that. He also has another book, by the way, uh, which I always mention with this book, which I would like you also to try to get. And this is George Maqdisi, The Rise of Colleges. And there he shows that the Western University, the PhD degree, the doctoral dissertation, academic freedom, defense of your thesis, the university chair, the university quad, and just go on and on. These come out of the traditional madrasa system, and here we mean the madrasa system as higher education. The madrasa that produces the faqih, the mujtahid, and the mufti. We don't mean by that the little madrasas that we have today that are kutab that are just teaching children how to memorize the Quran. So we have a, but we have a deep humanistic tradition. And our humanism, you know, is transcendent humanism. And this is one of the gifts of God to us. 
and the Sufis are masters of it, although the Prophet ﷺ is the giver. Um, the Sufis say, for you to become truly human, you must restore your fitrah. Okay, that's another say, way of saying what we've been saying all along. You've got to become real. And you have in you the male and female principle in every part of you, in every cell. So it's got to be properly ordered. And that is what? Your fitrah. That's the way you were born. That's the way you were corrected. So uh, to become truly human, then we have to restore the fitrah. And for that reason also, one of the main goals of Sufism is restoring the natural self making you the way you were created to be. Becoming human then means to restore the original human composition, the original human disposition, the original human uh, setup. And um, out of this you get then transcendent humanism. I probably should stop reading because it's taking too much time. But, and I think I'm going to have to do that. Um, but transcendent human, humanism, what do, mean be, what, what do we mean by that? We mean by that that um, <laughs> you have a lower self and a higher self. We have people who go higher, we have people who go lower. So as long as you are with your animal emotions, passion and anger, then basically you're an animal. In fact, you're lower than an animal because you weren't created to be one. So, of course, we know from the Sharia that we have to purify ourselves. We have to conquer our passions. We have to get our anger under control. And we have to get our passions under control. When we do that, we give the spirit power over the heart. And then we become real. Okay, so we transcend, we go above that lower humanity that we have, which we might call our animal nature. We have to do that. Okay, and then you get a human being, man or woman, who is really the perfected human being. And we will never be perfect as our prophet was perfect, because he's infallibly perfect. But you can be perfected. And that is one of the main purposes of the religion, to perfect you, to purify you, to enable you to be the best you can be, to make you 100%. Okay, so that's transcendent humanism. And this is also, you know, what comes out of this becoming real by drawing close to God. There is no God but God. La ilaha illallah. But, but there is no Man, there is no human being without God. There is no God but God, but there is no man without God. And here I'm using the word man as we used it yesterday, meaning the perfect human being, the perfect human being. You have to have God, and you've got to be close to Him. You've got to be near Him. Here I'd like to quote one of the s statements of the Salaf. Um... From, this is from Imam al-Ghazali, Allah be pleased with him. He says that the <coughs> Salaf would say, the true scholars are the shining lamps of their times. The true scholars are the shining lamps of their times. Surajul Azmina, Surajul Azmina. Each of them is the radiant light, the misbah, by which the people of his age receive light. Okay, this is transcendent humanism at its fullest. And here we're talking about that scholar who is a saint, who practices what he preaches, and who knows God, and who believes in the hereafter, and who knows that the hereafter is real, and that the hereafter is better and more lasting than this world. Those people are surujul azmina. They are the radiant lamps of their times. And each of them is the misbah. We could say misbah al-huda. They are the radiant lights of guidance of their age. 
So you can't have transcendent humanism without the transcendent human. It's not learned just from books, right? It's got to be imbibed from great men and great women. Al-Hasan al-Basri, may God be pleased with him, he says, if it were not for the true scholars, again, the same kind of scholar, people would become animals. People would become Baha'im. And this is so relevant to our age, isn't it? So relevant to our age. We've got to have, you've got to be those people. You've got to be those scholars of the hereafter who give humanity its humanity back and who make that transcendent humanism a reality. Is there anything that can save us in the present situation? When we appear in the world's eyes as the most bestial of subhumans and only when you begin to show yourself as the most angelic of transcendent human beings doing good and bringing peace and solving the problems inshallah then we can turn it around and that might actually be easier than you think bi ta'ala so now uh, what I would like to do is just to mention a little bit about how about the men you know who unlock the camel load the hidden camel load in the Sufi tradition and there are many of them but I just want to go through and give some names and I'm going to do that in chronological order so here I think it's uh, very good to begin with Jabir ibn Hayyan Jabir, Jabir ibn Hayyan uh, belongs to the second century of the Islamic era you know that's the eighth century of the common era and as you remember from lecture number one Jabir is one of the very first to be called a Sufi and he was a great man and he was a Sufi uh, Jabir as you know was a polymath he was a chemist he was an architect he was an astrologer he was a mathematician you name it um, and I mentioned before his Kitab was Sabi'in his book of 70 chapters which is one of his great chemistry works where he begins by praising God elaborately and then he talks about purification of the self and then he says words to the effect that if you don't praise God with me with the same heart and tongue and if you don't care about purifying yourself put down the book you have no reason to learn chemistry chemistry is for those who praise God and who purify themselves we talked about that and this is baffling to us today isn't it that's a secular science you know the the chemistry student goes out and gets drunk on Friday night probably Saturday night as well and he tries to get sober you know on Sunday so that he can go to class on Monday that's that's typical isn't it purification of the self praise of God what does that have to do with sulfur what does that have to do with mercury we would say everything because sulfur and mer mercury are the biggest manifestations of the male principle and the female principle and out of that comes all chemistry male and female principle sulfur is male principle pure and simple and mercury is female principle pure and simple that's the way we thought and so I'm finding out about myself I'm discovering about myself when I study chemistry and he's going to give you some incredible formulas he's going to produce for you incredible things yes but chemistry is a philosophical subject a religious subject you know as well so Jabir ibn Hayyan we have to mention and Jabir ibn Hayyan also is important because he is probably the first or certainly one of the first in Islamic history who begins to root knowledge Ta'seel al-ulum Jabir understood the importance of that and in my opinion one of the greatest accomplishments of Islamic civilization is Ta'seel al-ulum and we did this to every single science embryology mathematics veterinary medicine everything that what are the usul what are the first principles what is it that economics has in common with embryology because it does have something in common you see today we fragment knowledge 
Every type of knowledge is its own distinct independent field. And we're going to talk about that, I hope. I hope we get to the end. <clears throat> but this is what we call, the Sufis call, metaphorical knowledge. In other words, it's not real knowledge, it's information. And it multiplies itself infinitely. But it's not knowledge, it just confuses you. You've got to root knowledge for it to be real. Then the information becomes meaningful. <clears throat> so that's what we did with everything. What are numbers? What are geometric shapes? You know, what is their reality? They have ontological realities. So Jabba is one of the first to do that. And this is really, if only Muslims could be worthy, if we could be worthy of our tradition. And if today we could learn, again, how to root knowledge. Chemistry has to be rooted. Quantum physics has to be rooted. Mathematics has to be rooted. Mathematics is in trouble. Mathematics has been destroyed. Okay, one of the ways that was done, I, I'm not going to get into that because I'm not a mathematician, but um, I talk about lots of things I don't know anything about. You know, so I, I, I'm pretty good at that. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we have Jabir ibn Hayyan. Then let's also mention Sahal ibn Abdullah at Tustari. He belongs to the third century of the Islamic era. We've talked about him before, but he also is one of the writers who's not just writing about um, purification of the self and self-knowledge and things like that. Others are doing that. But he begins to write about wilaya, about the secrets of wilaya. So in that, then, he's beginning to unlock the hidden camel load. And then we have also al-Hakim al-Tirmidhi. Uh, he belongs to that same early generation. And he has Kitab Khatam al Awliya and other works. So this is what they're doing there. Um, then I think we can skip down to Imam al Ghazali. Imam al Ghazali is not only among the greatest, he, tends, he does have other books that talk about Ilm al Mukashafa. But in his Ihya Ulum al Deen, he prepares the ground for that. He gives you all the essentials for that. It's ilm al-mu'amala, but that ilm al-mu'amala is necessary, absolutely, to get to the ilm al-mukashifa. Uh, there's another great man that I'm going to mention, um, although you may not know him because he's Persian. This is uh, Rashid ad-Din Mayboudi. This man is brilliant beyond words. And he's a Persian. He writes in Persian prose. He has a book called Kashful Asrar. And, um, you know, it's worth learning Persian just to read people like my booty. This man uh, lived in the 6th century. That's the 12th century of the Common Era. Um, we can mention then uh, Umar ibn al-Farid. Now, Umar ibn al-Farid is a poet, as all of you know. But he is one of those brilliant Arab poets who has the gift of taking profound metaphysical truths and put them in poetry you know um, of course he says and uh, I won't try to say it in Arabic I'm sure I'll get it wrong but I think you know he says we were drunk before the grapes were even created you know I don't know I don't remember how he says that al karam you know that we, we that I was drunk before grapes were even created Okay, and of course, th this is that metaphysical world, but I mean, he, he's beautiful beyond words, uh, you know, but uh, th they express these truths in beautiful ways. Uh, we have to mention here Ibn Arabi, Muhyiddin, and, you know, today he's one of those people you don't dare mention in most circles, and that's really harmful to us because he is... Um, I myself, in my very humble and limited path that I've had in the past, I wasn't even allowed to look in his books for over 13 years. You know, and I know other sheikhs who will not allow students to look at his books without special permission. And I remember that in like one of his books, Al-Futuhat al makiyah 
for years I couldn't get belong beyond the first sentence because it, it trips you up. It's meant to do that. If you can't read this first sentence, just put the book down. You're not ready. And it took a long time before actually a Moroccan sheikh read it with me and talked with me for a long time. And they said, oh my God, I think I've got it. Mm -hmm. And then we read for, for days and days and days. And it was very beautiful. But, um, you know, he's not accessible. Okay, and always we say, you've got to have permission to read his books. And permission's not enough. You've got to be deeply founded in the religion, and you've got to be on a spiritual path. Otherwise, you will misunderstand <coughs> everything he says, and it will be a fitna for you. But this man is a Shaykh al-Akbar. He is absolutely incredible. And if anyone has an answer to everything, he is one. And then we want to talk about his, uh, you know, rough contemporary, Jalaluddin Rumi. Um, this man, again, is a poet, and a Sufi poet, as you all know, but he puts the metaphysics in the most incredible <coughs> poetic setting that is conceivable. And uh, therefore, he's one of the real gifts that we have to Islamic s civilization. I want to mention here also Sadruddin al-Qunawi. Sadruddin al-Qunawi, he belongs, he, he dies a year after Rumi, by the way. And we could tell the story of Qunawi and Rumi, it's a very beautiful story. Because when Shams Tabrizi <coughs> is murdered, and we don't know for sure that he was murdered, but most people believe he was. He disappeared and never came back again. But, uh, and he is Rumi Sheikh, and that is one of the great tragedies. And he was a great scholar, a great Shafi'i scholar. And, you know, he was a great man. He was an upright man. Uh, he was also a very difficult person. Um, you know, he spoke the truth and he feared no one. And, um, but he is Rumi Sheikh. And Rumi, in, his way, in a way, is his Sheikh as well. And when he's killed, that's really one of the greatest crimes in the history of Wilaya. And it's one of the places where you can talk about the crimes of the Murids the crimes the Murids do, because they were saving their sheikh from this man that they didn't understand. So when Shems leaves the life of Rumi, that's when Rumi begins to pour forth all of this incredible poetry. And it's all a poetry of love that has been lost, and love that cannot be fulfilled again. And it's very sad. It's very sad. And it's very beautiful at the same time. But Al-Qunawi, Sadruddin Al-Qunawi, whose father-in-law is Ibn Arabi, you know, he then begins to spell out in rational terms all of that world, that beautiful world. And he is the close friend of Rumi. And he is the companion of Rumi. We can't say that he's like a sheikh of Rumi because nobody takes the place of Shams Tabrizi. But Qunawi loved Rumi, and Rumi loved Qunawi. And Qunawi uh, also was extremely pious. And if you go to Konya and you want to visit Rumi, you really should go to Qunawi first, and go to Shams Tabrizi second, and then go to Rumi. That's what they say is the Adab. But, Shams, but Qunawi, he has this incredible khalwa in his mosque, where he spent so much of his time. I had the honor to go in there and to pray a little bit, and I'm, and I'm proud of that. And um, I was filled with all kinds of uh, joys because of that. But Qunawi uh, and Rumi, they, he dies a year after Rumi. In fact, when Rumi died, they asked Qunawi to lead the funeral prayer. And every time he tried, he fainted. He couldn't do it. And then they said, bring the Qadi al-Qudat and, and have him lead the funeral prayer. And, and Qunawi died years later, but the works of Qunawi are amazing, amazing. Also, we can mention Azizuddin Nesafi, who writes in Persian. But he's another one of those incredible Persian prose writers. Um, you have Saeed din Farghani, also Persian. Uh, you have also uh, Mu'ayyid din Jandi, he's also Persian. These belong to the 7th century and the early 8th century. 
of the Islamic era, that's the, the 13th century, the 14th century, of the common era, uh, Abdul Razak Kashani or Al Kashani. This man is incredible. Writes in Arabic, of course, also in Persian. Um, then you have Sharaf al Din Dawood al Qaisari. And these are all, and he writes in Arabic as well, and Persian as well. And these people, I know some of you probably read in them, they are astounding. I remember reading Al Qaisari, and you know he begins by talking about existence. That just, you know, I had to read that like twenty times. It's like, what is this? What is this? This is profound beyond words. Uh, then I'm going to mention after that a person who belongs to the same era, the eighth century of the Islamic era. The, the 14th of the uh, common era, and this is Shamsuddin Muhammad Hafiz, the great Persian poet. This man is incredible. And we have to mention Abdul Karim Al Jili. He belongs to um, also the, he dies in the 15th century of the common era, and he writes Al Insan Al Kamil. Um, and then we have uh, the great Persian. Poet Abdurrahman Jami, and he's called uh, Khatam. He's called the seal of the Persian poets. These people put into poetry what cannot be put into words, other than poetry. And uh, let's just mention for the barakah of the names, uh, Al Imam Al Rabbani Sheikh Ahmed Sirhindi. This is the 17th century, so we're coming into almost modern times. And um, I want to mention here the great Chinese Muslim scholar of the 17th century, Wang Daiyu. And Wang Daiyu, he does all of this amazing work, using these people, by the way, plus the Chinese sources, to explain Islam in Chinese terms, so that it makes sense to the Chinese Muslims, and it makes sense to the Chinese Buddhists, and the Chinese Confucianists, and the Chinese Taoists, and many of them come into Islam because of him. And if you read about his life, and there's a very good book on his life in English, you have these stories of, like, the abbot of the, I think, Iron Mountain Monastery, who's master of martial arts, and he comes to Wan Dayu, and in typical Chinese form, he says, I just have, like, maybe two questions or three questions. Question one, okay, that's a good answer. Question two, that's a good answer. Question three, that's a good answer. I've become a Muslim. <laughs> They're very intelligent people, mashallah. They, they know aql. Um, and we could mention others, Abdul Ghani ibn Ismail al-Nabulusi, and nabulusi who's 18th century, almost in modern times. Uh, then I have to mention the great Chinese Liu Ji, who follows up Wang Dayu, he's 18th century. And um, there are others to mention as well. Maybe we can end by mentioning the great Pakistani, Indian, Pakistani, Urdu poet, Persian poet, who am I going to talk about? Muhammad Iqbal. And Muhammad Iqbal, I mean, this man, uh, what he puts into poetry is beyond words. And um, so, how are we doing with time? Almost ready to shut down, aren't we? So what I wanted to talk about here is where do the certainties come from? And I think I'm not going to do that because there's no time. So I want to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, um, synthesizing knowledge, rooting knowledge. For the Sufis, um, much of modern secular knowledge would be seen as veiling real knowledge. Okay, so it's a veil. It is not um, a telescope that actually shows you what's out there. Because of its failure to integrate itself into a wider view of the world that ties all phenomena to the fundamental nature of existence as the creation of God.
I hope you don't mind me reading that to you because I work on these things and you know I should just speak without reading it so if I work on I'm going to try to get it polished the best I can but again um, you have to have <coughs> knowledge and science you know that integrates itself psychology for example economics for example anything it's got to integrate itself into the wider <coughs> view that ties all phenomena including all sciences including revelation uh, together on the basis of an understanding of the fundamental nature of existence as the creation of God um, modern knowledge maybe I shouldn't use that word secular knowledge reductionist knowledge focuses on the branches but neglects the roots it looks at the surfaces but it doesn't go deep it studies what we call secondary causes asbab but it neglects al musabbib the causer of the causes it <laughs> lacks ultimate significance therefore and it focuses on outward form the surah but is unable to grasp the ma'na it's unable to grasp the uh, ultimate significance the true meaning and this is why it is said and I'm not saying this um, and I hope not in a petty way that modern science cannot explain anything and in the modern philosophy of science modern philosophers of science are pretty good on this they generally are aware of this they can describe and they can get relationships they can work out relationships but they can't explain what is this and usually they will explain what is it by describing it now that's not the explanation of what it is and we in our Sufi tradition call this horizontal blindness the blindness of horizontality and horizontality this is horizon right this is horizontal so we mean by horizontality when we ascribe one thing to another thing and that thing to another thing in other words you have to have verticality you've got to find your creator you've got to find the explanation of all of these asbab you cannot explain things by relating them to other things that need explanation by relating those to other things that needs explanation we call that horizontality and we call it blindness and that's where atheism dwells that's the house of atheism once you put the verticality up there like the full moon that we just see um, here above us then you don't have the house of atheism has been lights have been turned on it's not dark anymore it becomes light and it will become a house of belief again one of the Quran's most fundamental teachings and I wanted to, tonight to talk about the Quran and how the Sufis lived with it in fact I made a lesson I probably betrayed my lesson because I talked too much but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how they talk about wudu how they talk about salat they believe in wudu and salat just like you and I but they will talk about these things symbolically in a way that's beautiful and the faqih won't do that and he's not supposed to the faqih is a little bit dry and he's supposed to be or she's supposed to be they're also faqihas but he's not t supposed to tell you the symbolic meaning of ruku'ah but the Sufi will and he's not and he's going to say pray like that but be aware that this is emblematic and they do that with everything because they see everything as a sign they've got answers for everything uh -oh. but one of the Quran's most central teachings is do not look on the things of this world as independent realities don't take this world for granted the finite points to the infinite nothing finite nothing created can explain itself except with reference to the uncreated. 
So do not look on the things of this world as independent realities, for they are all, in fact, entirely dependent for their existence on the reality, with a capital R, that is God, whose glory they were created to reveal. Um, knots of the soul. So the Sufis talk about having uqad, having knots in your soul. And you need to get rid of them, right? How do you untie the knots of the soul? And um, untying the knots of the soul is to find the key of understanding divine unity, the divine unity that goes through everything. We seek to untie the knots of the soul by making ourselves aware of the incredible, infinite harmony and beauty that go through all the universe and uh, the necessity of humans to go beyond material existence. You can't stop there. You know, you've got to go beyond the material to the immaterial. And when we do this, it unties the knots of the soul. Um, so, the Sufis therefore sought out the principles underlying all things. And this is what underlies that great project of rooting knowledge, making knowledge coherent, all knowledge. You search out the principles underlying all things. And this was the goal of these great Sufis that wrote the books on these things. Most Sufis don't do this. They, they just enter ibadah, self-purification, and they have mukashifa, but they don't tell you about it. The ones who tell you about it are very few. And they do it most, mostly because they have to. This is what they understand, that they have to reveal this. Um, so in searching out the principles underlying all things, it was not the goals of the Sufis to create an esoteric science of the world. We said before, and we emphasize this, that in Islam we bring the exoteric and the esoteric together so that one is the mirror of the other. So these are not esoterics, they're not botanies. They're people who believe in this outward reality and it's transparent for them. They see in it the radiance of the eternal truths that are behind it. So in doing this, they're not creating esoteric sciences. They're creating real sciences that are metaphysically grounded. Their goal was educational in that, in rooting sciences. And it was to lead people out of darkness into light and to bring fruition and perfection and to bring to perfection and fruition the latent faculties of human beings so that they may gain salvation and spiritual freedom. Um, the Sufis would say that modern reductionist knowledge is metaphorical. Um, in other words, what we call science today is a metaphor for science, but it's not actually science. Science in Latin means knowledge. It is a metaphor for knowledge, but it's not real knowledge. Until you root it, until you give it its metaphysical base, it's not real knowledge. It's not actually real science. So whenever one created thing is ascribed to another created thing as if that were sufficient to have an infinite series of you know explanations that this comes from this a comes from b b comes from c they're all created things we go back to z then we go then we have a plus or whatever you cannot have an infinite series of finite causes it's impossible why? Because you wouldn't be able to reach the present. If, you know, this world was self-created, which is totally impossible, if it were the result of chance and random, and there were an infinite series of finite causes extending to the past, well, guess what? We wouldn't be in the present, because you cannot cross an infinite set. You wouldn't be, and, and this is what our theo theologians talked about, from, uh, you know, before the time of Imam Ghazali, may God be pleased with him. But whenever one created thing is ascribed to another created thing, 
That is a metaphor. Um, it is, and if you take it as knowledge, then it is a veil. It is a metaphor for knowledge. But if you take it for knowledge, then it becomes a veil. True knowledge, worthy of human beings, is knowledge in harmony with the knowledge of God and the rooting of all knowledge. And they also call that wrong-headed knowledge. To seek knowledge without the aim of finding the roots of knowledge in God and the nature of existence is wrong-headed. Um, it leads to knowledge without end. This is what we see in the world today. Information without end. Okay? And uh, if you're teaching the philosophy of science in an American university, or I would presume any university, but especially in American universities, let's say that you're teaching the philosophy of science for chemistry. Uh, one of the problems you're going to face is that the chemistry book that you begin with at the beginning of the semester will have been replaced by a new chemistry book by the end of the semester. That's great, right? Progress. No, not quite. As Sir Arthur Eddington said, it is very disturbing that every time we have a new discovery, we have new, a new theory. That means you don't have a theory. It means you're not rooted. It means you didn't have a right beginning. And I have a friend, maybe he's listening, um, he's a dear friend in America who teaches philosophy of science. And uh, he said it's very frustrating for him too. Like, the ground's always moving underneath you. What kind of philosophy is this? Again, what he should do is teach them the real thing. You know, Ibn Arabi. <laughs> <laughs> they probably like it. They probably like it. Um, so this leads to knowledge without end, but it's not knowledge, it's veiling knowledge. But that knowledge is always deficient because it is cut off from its own reality. <clears throat> okay, so how many minutes left? Three. <laughs> okay, so let's conclude. Um, I'd like to conclude by saying that we have to find our, our way back. Um, you, brothers and sisters, and I as your brother in Islam, we have the richest tradition of any people on earth. Many people on earth have rich traditions. They do. But yours is second to none. And it's just you know, lying there in the dust. No one cares about it. No one really reads it. Even people who study it academically don't really understand it. It's very important for us to imbibe this tradition and to bring it back to life. And I believe that كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ You are the best nation brought forth for humankind. Uh, Imam al-Bukhari, he said, that means you are the best of all people to all people. That's who we were. Truly, that's who we were. We were good to all people. We benefited all people. Um, this is what we have to be again today. But because of the paradoxical situation that we're in today, it's almost like, and I hope that this is not depressing, it's almost like it's all or nothing. Either we go back and get this and bring it to life, and you have among yourself men and women who are intelligent enough to do that, and who are gifted enough to do that, and who are also abreast of the modern world well enough to do that. Um, and we have that in other Muslim communities throughout the world, in England, in the United States, in Canada, in France, in other communities, We've got to do this. This is a big project. We've got to find our way back. And we've got to bring that tradition to life. And we've got to understand it. And we've got to apply it. And we've got to apply it to the environment, to city planning. We've got to apply it to our arts and our crafts. We have to apply it to our science and technology. And technology is one of the gifts of the modern world. But, like so many things in the modern world, it's a mixed blessing. Because who controls technology? 
Many of you work in technology. And you know that uh, probably none of you who works in technology works by yourself. You always work on a big team and you don't even know who's on that team. And you don't even know how big that team is. And you may not even know what you're working on. You're working on a particular aspect of the problem, right? That's usually the way it works. Highly, highly specialized. But who controls this? The law of efficiency and rules of good and evil and even ultimate benefit and harm. They don't rule it. And this in a world that if only it were run by ideas. But the modern world that you and I live in today, it's not directed by ideas. We have to give it ideas. We have to teach it how to think again. But the modern world today is directed by technology, and we don't know where it's going, and we don't even know what it's doing. You know, what is that iPad doing to your child who can't make eye contact now? What's it doing to their psychology and personality? We don't really know. And there's going to be even a more advanced iPad in just a matter of days and another one in a matter of months. And I've got an iPhone that's more intelligent than I am. It's doing things all the time I know nothing about. And presenting to them to me as presents. It's like, what did you do? Who gave you permission? And it's going to be replaced very soon by one that's even smarter. So where is this going? It's got a march of its own, and we don't really know where that's going. And then you have the other great mover of people today, movies, films, YouTube, and stuff like that. And maybe first and foremost, banks and investment. That's what runs the modern world. So can you take that bull by the horn if you call it a bull? Or that hydra, you know, hydra is the monster that every time you cut off a head, two heads come up. Can you take care of that? And we can. But to do that, we've got to become a real community. And by that, we mean a community that has powerful values, Islamic values, human values, and who understands them and can make them intelligible to the whole world, and who can express them in art, in beauty, in poetry, in music, and in making peace in the world, and so forth. So it's like we have come so low in our history that you know, we are on the eve of destruction, it would seem, unless you are able to bring about the dawn, and you can do that, but we've got to bring this tradition back <clears throat> and we've got to take benefit from it. May God enable us to do that. Bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. And thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's, it's always a joy to be with you. And I look forward to coming back soon. Pray that that can be very soon, inshallah. And, um, you know, um, let's take some questions, okay? So... Mm. One of the questions is, uh, what is meant by Qutb and Rauth? Because uh, yesterday, when we were talking about Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, um, I used these words, didn't I? And I said that he was al Qutb al Rauth. So some people want to know what a Qutb is and what a Rauth is. Uh, first of all, the Rauth is higher than the Qutb. The Rauth is higher than the Qutb. But the Qutb is al Muta'ali fi kulli shay. The Qutb is the one who is exalted in everything. Um, I have to be careful making this statement, but I would say most people who are called by this word, they're going to be masters of everything. Like al Qutb al Dardir, uh, al Qutb Abdul Qadir because he is Shaykh al-Islam. He is a master, he is muta'alin fi kulli shay. There's no field that he is not at the very top of. This is a qutub. They're at the highest point in all things. And they're like the kings of every discipline. This is 
uh, outward as well as inward. And uh, we say that the Qutb yajma'u bayn al-ilmi wa salah. So the Qutb has incredible knowledge, but he is able to join that with absolute goodness. So this is one of the terms they use. And these terms go back to the very beginning of Islam. And they belong, I believe, to that other camel load. And some hadith, like we mentioned the hadith from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad, uh, in which it says the companions were talking about the abdal. They were talking about the substitutes. And then the Prophet وسلم, begins to explain that the abdals are the one who, when one dies, another one is substituted for him. And then he tells us about the awliya. I love that hadith because of what it says about the awliya. We had that in our lesson. But then also it does mention abdal. Now, as a rule, any hadith that talks about abdal or aqtab or awtad or these other words, it's going to be da'if. I would say that's because it belongs to the other camel load. Because that camel load is not transmitted by the same kind of riwayah. It's transmitted in the sudur, the hearts of the people of the past. And I've heard this from great scholars, including great muhaddithin, <clears throat> that the great muhaddithin, if you ask them about these terms, they would say that we do not deny that. And they believe it to go back to the beginning, but it's not there in the central teaching of hadith. It's not there in the camel load that's given to everyone. But they knew there's another camel load. And they believe it came from there. So Qutb is one of those words. And so he is al-muta'ali fi kulli shay. They, they are at the top in everything. In everything. Outward sciences, religious sciences, spiritual sciences. They are the kings of all those sciences. وَيَجْمَعُونَ دَائِمًا بَيْنَ الْعِلْمِ وَالصَّلَاحِ And they put knowledge and righteousness together in everything they do. Here we could even talk about rooting knowledge because even that salah will be in all the outward knowledges that they know. The ghoth, again, we are told, I am taught, and um, that the ghoth is higher than the qutub. We're, we're told the ghoth is higher than the qutub. And the ghoth is alladhi yurithu bil ilm. So he is the one who uses this knowledge he has, which is muta'alim, to help the people, to restore the people, to give the people life. And he takes the hands of the people, and he guides the people. And uh, as in the case of Al-Qutub al ghawth al Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he protects the people from the tyrants. Sheikh Abdul Qadir is a good example of that. And um, he disciplined the kings and the princes. They had to obey him. They feared him. And um, the rich as well. And, you know, we could tell, that, tell those stories. <coughs> Shaykh Abdul Qadir, <coughs> if a poor man came in in rags, he would stand up for him. And he would seat him by himself, like a king. He never stood up for a rich person. And he never stood up for a king or a prince. But then he's not polite, he's not impolite either. So if he knows they're coming, he'll leave the room. And then he enters the room standing, and they stand up. And then he sits down, because he doesn't want to offend them either. But he's not going to be sitting and stand up. He didn't do that. <clears throat> and he loved them, and he served them also. And they benefited from him. He was for everyone. But he's very serious. And he was a protector of the poor. And he was a protector of the Palestinian refugees. Again, this is the Shaykh of Salah ad-Din Ayyubi. This is the Shaykh of the Jihad movement. You know, this is the Shaykh of Nur ad-Din and Imad ad-Din and Shirku. And um, he takes in the Palestinians. And of course, in the Crusades, the refugees are not just Palestinians. They're Syrians. They're Egyptians even in Mansoura and other places. They're Iraqis as well, because the Crusaders hit everything. 
and <clears throat> he takes them in, he takes care of them, and um, so the, this is what the Roth does, and um, so that's the first question. Okay, um, can you please elaborate on if you're not present in the absence of the Shaykh, then you're probably not present in his presence. Okay, so I said that. And how am I going to get off the hook? Um, I say lots of things that sound poetic. Um, and maybe they have poetic value, but I'm not a poet. And um, in any case, <coughs> Hudur is a big thing. To be present. And may God give us Hudur. And I'm sure that we have Hudur right now. But the fact that you are physically sitting here and I am physically sitting near and that we could shake hands or we could talk to each other or drink a cup of tea afterwards this is not really presence this is a shabah this is a ghost of presence it's an outward form and the life of that is the presence of the spirit the presence of the spirit that we are together in spirit right now. And al-arwahu junudun mujannada. The spirits of human beings are armies marshaled in many ranks. Those who recognized each other. As one transmission says in the other world, we were together in that world. We recognize each other here. We like each other. We feel comfortable with each other. That's all spiritual. And that's the real suhba. That's the real hudur. And even in one of the hadith about al-arwahu junudun mujannada, one of the transmissions says, tatufu bil layl. They rove about at night, like looking for each other, looking for their friends. Where is he? Where is she? So this is one of the secrets. And therefore, um, the, the spiritual path is never just one of physical attendance. And that's why when you're in the presence of the shaykh, you want that to be a spiritual presence, as much as it can be. That's what makes it beautiful. That's why you like it in the first place. But hold on to that spirituality. Don't let it go. And often the tarbiyah, the education of the shaykh, especially in our path. Most of it happens in his absence. When you're with him, it's like you're seeded. The, the ground is tilled. But it's when you're away from him, that's when the growth occurs. And this is because they have du'as, for example, that they make for everyone, every murid and every murida. And they may have a million of them all over the world. So, um, you want that to be a spiritual, and if you are spiritually present with Him, when you're in His physical presence, you will, inshallah, be able to remain in that presence after He's gone. And you can picture Him, you can think of Him, you can reflect on Him, you can benefit from Him. So this is something we want to learn. And of course, in our time we have the internet, and we try to use that as much as we can, you know, to stay physically in contact, although that's not physical, it's virtual. You know, but we see each other, we hear each other's voices, we send emails and so forth. Uh, this is also very important, and that's good as well. And, you know, we believe that it is also spiritually effective. And then another thing, too, is that when you have a body of murids and muridas, then in the absence of the sheikh, they become the sheikh. This is why we say, meet with each other. Okay, because when you do that, it's like you bring that reality back, which is his reality. And this is why also, you know, uh, if there's a question you have that you can't ask the shaykh because he's not there, it's very good to ask some of the murids, especially those of them that are highly educated. Those of them that are scholars that are on the path, or those, those of them that are men or women who've been on it for a long time. And they'll get you an answer, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And maybe they'll contact the shaykh to get it. But this is always an issue that comes up. 
And um, inshallah, I know, and this is an old thing with the Sufis. Um, one of the great sheikhs that I was honored to know was an Eritrean. Um, his name was Shadli. Shadli, not Shadili, but Shadli. Shadli is a saint from the Yemen who's named after Imam Shadli. But they call him Shadli. And um, he's a saint associated with coffee, a particular dua that you make for coffee and so forth. <coughs> I don't know much about him, but this Yemeni, this Eritrean's named after, his name is Shadli. His real name is Umar. Uh, and uh, he's called Shatra. He's called Shatra. That's an Eritrean name. He's Al Bayt. And he's an amazing man. Oh, he's an amazing man. And he's still alive. Very hidden. Very, very hidden. He's the kind of person that if he makes dua, finished. That's what I believe. And um, he was associated with an Eritrean sheikh called al Haj Yaqub. al Haj Yaqub was um, of Ahl al-Bayt, also one of these powerful sheikhs. And this goes back to the days, to a civilization, a culture in which they're riding camels and they're living in, in the ways that people lived hundreds of years ago in our time, in the 20th century. But uh, the Sheikh ya Haji Yaqub had a particular murid. And um, he told him one day in the desert, stay here until I come back. He didn't come back. He didn't come back. He didn't come back. A year went by. Another year went by. God sustained the man. Of course, people will find him and bring him water and stuff like that and food. But finally, al Haj Yaqub came back. The man had long hair down to here. You know, but he became one of the greatest of the awliya. And it's all happening in the physical absence of that shaykh. And we talked about the nine saints of uh, Java yesterday, who are incredible. There's nothing you can say less than that. They are incredible. One of those whom I love the most is Kali Jaga. And his story, I wish we could just tell it, and the Nusantarans, the Malays here could add. But Kali Jaga, his, saint, his sheikh, who I think is... Uh, <coughs> Is, is Sunan, uh, what is it, Gunung Jati? Gunung Jati, is that, do I have it right? Um, but his, his sheikh was a great sheikh. And uh, Kali Jaga was, he was a Muslim, but he was a Robin Hood. He was from the aristocrats. And he's very wealthy, but he would actually steal from his own father to give to the poor. And he, and he would steal from people to give to the poor. It's sort of like Fudayl ibn Iyad. And one time, um, you know, he encountered his sheikh in the forest of Java, in the jungle. And uh, he saw that his staff was gold. He said, give me your staff. And he took it. And the saint fell down. And the saint said, could you please give me back your staff? And he said, it's gold. He said, it's not gold. If you'll just look at it, it's wood. He said, but it's gold. And he said, you want gold? And he said, yes, I give it to the poor. They said, well, just take your pick. And they said, the whole forest became gold. Now, forgive me, this is karamat, and, you know, karamat you have to believe in. You don't have to believe in this story. I do believe in things like that. You don't have to be like me. Something happened there in any case. And um, so, Kali Jaga became the murid of this sheikh. And again, the sheikh said, stay here until I come back. And so he stayed there. And he gave him things to do. And he's at the riverside. That's why he's called Kali Jaga. And the sheikh then came back after a time, I don't remember how long, a year, two years, and brought him books. He said, study all of these. And then he left him. And then when he came back again after a long time, Kali Jaga was ready to go. Not just from the books, but from... The connection, and this all took place in absence. And then Kali Jaga, he's one of the ones who will create the puppets, and others do that as well. He's the one who, he reinterprets, he takes interpretive control over all Javanese culture, and he reinterprets numbers, symbols, colors, everything, Islamically and correctly, because the Hindu Buddhists do that. 
that two means something, blue means something, green means something. So he says, well, let's give it even a more accurate meaning. Numbers and two, like every two will be La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The banyan tree. He creates incredible architecture. He also helps the rice peasants, uh, you know, to farm in a more efficient way. You know, so again, uh, this is one of these stories that I love. Again, especially the spreading of Islam through puppets. This is just incredible. You know, maybe we should try that. You know, try that. But um, we, have to use, we have to use the media that's available. So in any case, um, this is one of the problems that so many people face. That, uh, what do I do in your absence? Well, that absence shouldn't be a problem for you. It should not be. And inshallah, we, may we be in each other's presence as much as possible. We want to be in each other's physical presence as much as possible. There's nothing like that. Um, would we say that Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani's path, as it is a combination of Imam uh, Abu Hamad al Ghazali's path and Imam Ahmed al Ghazali's path, mm -hmm. is a combination of the two types of tasawwuf mm -hmm. mentioned in the definition of ihsan in the hadith of Jibreel that you mentioned in the first class? Okay, now what are the two types of tasawwuf? If the person who wrote this question is here, would he or she please raise their hand? What were the two types of tasawwuf that I mentioned in the first class? I probably should have read this before I tried to answer it. I don't understand the question. Uh, in any case, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Um, they're all doing the same thing, but the program of Imam al-Ghazali of reviving the religious sciences, making them real again. Um, and of course the main thing that Imam al-Ghazali is concerned with are the worldly scholars. The scholars who are peacocks, the scholars who are rivals of each other, the scholars who know everything and know nothing, and who betray the people. Okay, And, and you, you can read the Ahya, and you probably have. The first chapter is Kitab al-Ilm, and it's about the false scholar and the plague of the false scholar and making us scholars of the hereafter. So this will be exactly the program of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. That's not the tariqah of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. The tariqah of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani is his particular spiritual methodology. And that, quite possibly, differs from that of Imam al-Ghazali or Imam Ahmed al-Ghazali. I don't know enough about them to say. Okay, so each of them have their own spiritual methodology. But that program, which is mostly outward knowledge, of bringing knowledge back to life, this uh, they are the same in. And uh, therefore, that the creation of the generation of Salah ad din is very much the product of the efforts of Imam al-Ghazali and of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. And here they're on the same page completely. Um, the way that Shaykh Abdul Qadir goes about it is very direct. I mean, he brings the scholars under his power. And I actually don't like to talk about karamat. I just talked about a big karama and of uh, Kali Jaga and his Shaykh. But, and so I'm, I'm not comfortable talking about karamat because uh, some Muslims, uh, it's really hard for them to believe in that. And that shouldn't be the case. But we don't want to be a fitna to anyone. And also it's true that in some Muslim societies, people lie about the karamat all the time. And because they lie about them, people just don't want to hear anything about them. And, you know, so for that reason, I prefer not. But it's largely through Karamat that Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani brings the scholars totally under his control. He is a scholar, but they obey him. It's almost as if he will take away their license. You know, he will take away their ability to teach. Either you teach correctly or you won't teach at all. So he reforms the schools. He reforms the scholars. And so this is the practical way 
that he's actually implementing the teaching of Imam al-Ghazali, in my opinion. <clears throat> Is Imam al-Sanusi's tariqah essentially an offshoot of the Qadili way? Well, we didn't say that. Um, you know, we were saying that the Sufis take part in jihad. And the Sufi orders did that as well. Uh, the Shaykh of Imam Sanusi is Ahmed ibn Idris. <clears throat> and Ahmed ibn Idris has his own path, uh, which is a beautiful path. And um, that path, you could say, is it, it is rooted in the Shazali path. Uh, some Ahmed Idrisis would take issue with that if I said it. Um, I actually have Ithan in the Ahmed Idrisi path also. My first primary Shaykh for 19 years was Ahmed Idrisi. Qadri. So he had the Qadri silsila of the highest order. <clears throat> he loved Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani intensely, but also he had that other path. And that path is the Sanusi path. And it's, they've got other paths as well. And of course, the Shadali path definitely goes back to Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. And uh, here also, we want to have respect for everyone and be careful not to offend anyone. And by my being a Qadri and exalting the exalted status of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, we want to be very careful not to offend anybody else or to make anyone feel who's a Shadri or Rifa'i, you know, or a Bedouwi or whatever they might be, that they are less, they're not. We don't believe that at all. We talked about that when we talked about the silsila and not cutting it. <clears throat> Can we read the Ihya on our own, or should we read it only with a teacher? What if the teacher is not available? Um, learning from teachers is very important. The Ijazah is very important in Islamic sciences. Uh, one of my teachers, who's also a colleague of mine, we taught together, and he's one of the greatest muhaddiths of this time, Sheikh Khaldun al-Ahdab, who's from Damascus. And his family is, is from Syria, also from, I don't remember if it's Hama, I think it's Hama and Damascus. He's a great scholar. But um, one of the things he used to emphasize to me is you have ijazah to read books. And don't let, the ijazah is there to empower you. It is not there to disempower you. So he would actually get angry if a person, let's say, would start reading a book like the book mentioned here, Ihya Ulum Adin, and then somebody would say that you don't have a sheikh reading this with you, you don't have any jazz in this, put it on the shelf. He would be furious. It's like, why can't I read this book? I can read Arabic. The thing is, is that if you want to master the book, you know, then of course, if you have a sheikh, it will go really well. That's the right way to do it. It doesn't mean that you can't read it. And you have the commentary of a Zabidi. He is your sheikh, and Zabidi will explain everything to you. And the fact is, is that we simply cannot always be with sheikhs. And you cannot always spend 30 years to read a book. You know, so we've got to also be able to read books. And um, in this, we can get general ijazas. And, you know, once you're connected to the ulama, and particularly once you're connected to these great Sufi sheikhs, they give you ijazah. And this enables you to use those books, and then you verify them with others. The great scholar is not the man or woman who doesn't make mistakes. It is the man or woman who doesn't correct his mistakes. Okay, so, um, you know, you don't have that much time. And we have to catch up. And um, I dislike very much the idea that don't read any books without a reader. Okay, they're not going to do anything then. You know, there's too much to read. There's too much to learn. And you want to have a shaykh bi'ithni lahi ta'ala who can keep you safe and who can answer your questions and who can put that right. And again, when you can study with the shaykhs, then that's it, that's paradise. And, in fact, if you study with them a little, you get a lot. And one of the things they're doing is teaching you how to read these books. Not like you've got to read every single line with them. That's not the way that the ones I know taught. And, um, 
you know, God guide us to what is right. Um, can you say something about the hierarchy of the saints? Well, we talked about Qutb Rauth, um, and I think we'll suffice with that. And when we talked about the awliya, we mentioned they have hierarchies. Hierarchies means ranks. And in fact, uh, hierarchy, do you, all, you all understand that word, don't you? Hierarchy, you have the lowest, you have the highest, and you have <coughs> infinite degrees in between. That's a hierarchy. And God creates everything in hierarchies. So we have greatest things created like the light of the Prophet Muhammad, the first thing created in my belief, and the most perfect thing ever created. Creation begins with the creation of the most perfect moment, in the most perfect time, in the most perfect place, in the most perfect individual. That's the Prophet Muhammad And this is something the Sufis believe, we know the hadith about God creating the pin and God creating the intellect and so forth, and I'm not going to get into that. The Sufis do. And they explain that this all comes together in that reality. We have the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah. I believe it belongs to the hidden corpus. Uh, apparently, it also does occur in the other books of hadith, generally not strong. I'm told that there is one transmission that's strong, and I'm told by others that even that one's not strong. I don't know. But there, uh, the Prophet tells Jabir, you know, what is the first thing that God created? The light of your Prophet, O Jabir. So you have these hierarchies. And that's really a big deal, brothers and sisters. And the saints are hierarchies, and you are too. You belong somewhere in the hierarchy of the believers. And there's no one in the history of human beings who is exactly like you. On the day of judgment, when you meet your fathers and your mothers in that joyous uh, reunion, you'll see how much you look like your mothers, how much you look like your fathers, but you're not the same. Each of them is distinctly different. And you have a place in the hierarchy of saints that nobody else has. That's why in your perfecting yourself and becoming real, real, and the way we talked about tonight, you take your position in the hierarchy of saints that you were created for. Uh, these are haqqa'iq that I know nothing about, but I get them from these books that I read in and love, and they are profound, absolutely profound, and out of that you get the secret of heaven and hell, and you get so many other things as well. So the saints do have a hierarchy, and there's a hierarchy in everything. In fact, um, when we talk about proofs for the existence of God, um, you know, we have the ontological proof of God, the proof of God from being, necessary being. We have cosmological proofs of God, that everything created in this cosmos that begins and is finite, it points to God. Okay, you have teleological argument, which we call delil al-inaya, delil al-itqan, that everything here is perfectly created to fit into the pattern of everything else. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful you cannot imagine. The golden section goes through everything created, which is a perfect cut in an infinite series of other cuts. So this can't be by chance. That's the teleological argument. And you have other arguments for it. But you have one which is called um, the, uh, um, the henological argument. Henological argument. This is a bad way to end. <laughs> Bewildering you with these Greek words. But the henological argument is the argument about the one. Henos means one in Greece, Greek. But the one among the many, that's what it means. And so it's the proof of the existence of God based on the hierarchical order of being. We never use that today because as modern reductionist secularists, we don't know much about hierarchy. And we also, given our democratic convictions, have some issues about that. 
But uh, that's a powerful argument, and it's also based on this reality of hierarchy. Forgive me for ending on that confusing note, but God enable us to, you know, be the best Muslims we can be, the best mu'mins we can be, the best muhsins we can be, and bring, be worthy of the Prophet, and bring this religion back to life in its glory, its mercy, and its goodness. Make us the best ummah for all human beings because we do good for all human beings. Ameen. And creation, the animals, the plants, the environment. Allahumma wa fiqna li ma tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa ammitna ala kalimati al-huda alimna ma yanfa'na wa wa fiqna lil amali bima alamtana bih وَجْعَلْ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ خَالِسًا مُخْلِسًا لِوَجْهِكَ الْكَرِيمِ يَا رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار And God bless you all. Keep me in your prayers. I wish I didn't have to leave. Although I love the place I'm going to. Yeah. And I love this place I'm leaving. And I love the place I'm going. Every place I go to, I love, by the way. You know, they ask me, what's your favorite country? Would you ask me an easy question? <laughs> I love them all. And what's your favorite food? I don't have an answer to that either. <laughs> and uh, most of this, those favorite questions, I just, they baffle me. I love this country and I love you. You are beautiful people. And you have deep roots. And you have done so much good in history. And you can do it again. And you will do it again. Bi-idhni Allah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.